let's continue on to the third and final session today, which is the ocean and the economy. During this session, we will deliberate on the economic implications of ocean-related environmental issues. The blue economy and blue ecology will be discussed while exploring sustainable marine and coastal tourism as a livelihood. These issues will be discussed in the context of climate change, climate justice, justice excuse me, and the impact of sea level rise on the global economy. The moderator for this session will be Dr. Norma Patricia Munoz Sevilla, Chairperson of the Climate Change Council of the Mexican Republic. The speakers include His Excellency Mike Rand, former longstanding Premier of South Australia, Minister for Sustainability and Climate Change, and National President of the Australian Labour Party. Also, Her Excellency Martha Delgado Peralta, Under Secretary for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Mexico. Dr. Shonali Pachuri, Acting Director of the Transitions to New Technologies Program and Senior Research Scholar with the Energy Program at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Austria. Sir David King, the UK government's former Chief Scientific Advisor. He founded the Center for Climate Repair at Cambridge, a global research and development hub in order to realize the goal of moving beyond decarbonization by researching and funding technologies to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And finally, the youth speaker, Maria Jaquez, president of a student environmental association called Cambio Ibero. Dr. Norma, I will give you the floor now to please begin the session. Okay, Summer, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can yeah. hear you. Okay. okay, thank you so much. Welcome to everybody to this uh, important session that um, is related to the issue of the economy. We heard already uh, for our speakers that the economy is very important just now to keep a, a healthy ocean. In this session, uh, the blue economy and the blue ecology will be very important for us. We will discuss with our speakers, brilliant speakers that we have today uh, in this session, how it works, the economy, how it works, the ecology, and how we can work in a blue way for this important ecosystem in our world. Uh, I would like to warmly welcome Ms. Marta Delgado, Dr. Shonali Pachori, Dr. Mike Rand, Sir David King, and Maria Jacks for this important session. Please, uh, I will give the floor to Dr. Mike Rand. Doctor, for you the floor, please. Hello. Um, I'm very delighted to be here, and it's an honor to be a patron of the World Sustainable Development Forum. And also, I'm delighted to be to participate in this POP uh, Oceans Virtual Summit. So pleased to be working again with young people. And I have to say, it was a, a pleasure just a few months back to join Ash, uh, Lawrence Gonzi, and so many of the people I have seen along the way today at, at Durango, I thought it was a magnificent conference. And, uh, and I think that it was important, uh, I thought important for me to talk about the international work of the climate group with subnational governments and major corporations, and also the Sustainable Markets Initiative led by the Prince of Wales and the World Economic Forum. And, and Ash and I were linked up uh, with that uh, just a few days ago. But there's no doubt that the oceans are the lifeblood of our international economy. So let me give you a couple of examples. I'm from a fairly large island, Australia. We have massive, a massive tourism industry. So let me give you a couple of examples. And so much of our um, attraction for visitors focuses on our marine environment and 16,000 mile coastline. So much we have world famous attractions like the World Heritage listed Great Barrier Reef, which is more than 1400 miles long. It's the biggest uh, uh, coral reef system in the world, larger in area than the UK, Switzerland and Holland combined. And there's also of course our beaches, 10,000 of them. So that's critically important for um, for tourism. And then there's Australia's uh, trade with 99% of our exports 
carried by ships across the oceans to destinations around the world. The shipping industry is responsible for carrying 90% of the world's overseas trade. About 50,000 cargo ships, uh, uh, including the carry uh, exports, affordable food and manufactured goods, plus the bulk transport of raw materials. And without them, uh, this trade would not be possible. There is also, of course, the crucial role of oceans in providing food. A few years back, I was Australia's permanent representative to the Food and Agriculture Organization and also the UN's World Food Programme. Fish and seafood are basic components in the diets. Our oceans support a harvest comprised of around 94 million tonnes of fish caught by the commercial fishing industry and 63 million tonnes from aquaculture. So given this importance, why do we treat our oceans as if they were giant septic tanks, sewers, rather than the lifeblood of sustenance and connectivity? And we've heard today about how we take our oceans for granted, treating them as an infinite resource to be used with impunity. We've also heard how we've assaulted our oceans on multiple fronts. David Attenborough, as you pointed out, has said that we now face the consequences of this maltreatment. But the International Panel on Climate Change tells us that global warming could mean sea levels, levels rising by more than a metre by the end of the century, affecting the lives of a billion people in countries large and small with devastating effects. There'll be a massive impact on the 680 million people living in low-level coastal zones as well as the 65 living on small island developing nations. These people will be especially at risk from a combination of flooding, increasing storms, and other weather events so extreme that they used to be seen as happening once every century, but could become once a year occurrences by 2050. Now, this of course will result not only in a massive loss of life, of homes and infrastructure, but will also have a colossal impact in terms of feeding and providing shelter for millions of dispossessed people, for treating the sick during co the consequent health crises, as well as the cost of recovery, reconstruction, and lost agricultural production. So the economic consequences, as well as the human cost, will be absolutely massive. The threat to small island Pacific countries of sea level rise has been eloquently highlighted by New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, and I hope at some stage we can involve her in one of our, our forums. She, even for New Zealand, 19 billion of its assets are at risk from sea level rise and flooding events, including five airports, 2,000 kilometres of road, 40,000 at homes. But Prime Minister Ardern speaks passionately about how climate change is impacting on Pacific Island states. These tiny nations contribute very little to global carbon emissions, but they are already amongst the first to experience the impact of warming and rising seas. Jacinda points out that it's not only storms that threaten Pacific countries, as devastating as they've been and will continue to be. There's also salt water intrusion from the sea into precious freshwater sources. Staple crops like taro have been devastated in some island coastal areas, with some aquifers at risk of becoming undrinkable and unfit to use on crops. She also points out that the increasing warming and acidification is changing the chemistry of seawater, threatening the habitats of marine life important for local diets. So, of course, the threat, as we've heard, to our oceans is not just from rising and warming sea levels and acidification. It's also about pollution. We've also already heard about the massive plastic uh, pollution with 8 million tonnes of plastic being dumped into the seas each year. Prince Charles has said that we are close to the point where whatever wild-caught fish we eat will contain plastic. And horrifyingly, people who eat seafood 
are ingesting 11,000 pieces of microplastic a year. Now, disgracefully, we've heard of vast islands of debris, including plastic that have become floating garbage dumps. Just one of them in the Pacific is, is estimated to contain 18 trillion pieces of trash and cover an area that the size of Texas. Now, going back to Australian tourism, the iconic barrier reef that I mentioned earlier is now under increasing threat. David Attenborough said the most vivid impact he's witnessed of the changing climate was revisiting the Great Barrier Reef. He said that upon first visiting the reef in the 1950s, he'd enjoyed the extraordinary experience of diving and suddenly seeing this multitude of fantastic, beautiful forms of life. But when revisiting the reef just a decade ago, he observed instead of multitudes of wonderful forms of life, I was struck by how much it was bleached white because of rising temperatures and increasing acidity in the seas. So I guess the question is, what is to be done in terms of bringing the economic and environmental importance of our oceans into balance? First of all, it starts with us as individuals. Do we continue to embrace or do we discard our own throwaway convenience culture? What is happening to our planet is not someone else's problem. It's yours and mine in whatever countries we live. And it begins with our lifestyles. Are we doing enough to limit what we consume and throw away? Do we still buy water in plastic bottles, even if we live in communities where the water supply is safe? Do we, are we still using plastic plates, knives, forks and straws? Do we still patronize cafes where they use plastic containers that are immediately thrown away and discarded? Are we active enough politically through environmental groups or political parties to argue the case for greater urgency in reducing emissions? Now we've all, one of the messages I wanna get across to everyone is all of us have to vote and encourage others to do so and vote out leaders who are climate deniers and uh, who actively and deliberately frustrate agreements on reducing carbon emissions. There's an election coming up in November somewhere where it would be a very, very good start. Now, much of the focus has been on the policies of national governments, but however, we mustn't neglect the importance of encouraging action by sub-national governments, who are often way ahead of their national counterparts in achieving positive change. In the US, Australia and Brazil, for instance, there are many states getting on with world leading climate action, despite their national governments who act like glove puppets of the fossil fuel industry. And as an Australian, I'm absolutely ashamed of the role of the current government in what it did at the last COP meeting to frustrate action. So subnational governments can have even a positive impact on the health of our oceans. When I was Premier of South Australia, I announced in 2008 that we'd be the first state in Australia to ban non-renewable plastic bags of the type used in supermarkets. This initiative was absolutely denounced by vested interest as unworkable for consumers and retailers alike, and they argued it would cost jobs. That didn't happen. It was instead embraced by the overwhelming majority of shoppers, and I saw one poll that showed 80% support. That ban alone has prevented billions of plastic bags entering the waste stream and getting into rivers and the sea. And we've also got a zero waste uh, uh, pr process and we've also got a container deposit uh, scheme. Again, hundreds of millions of containers that would have been washed away um, are recycled. Now, I'm pleased that other Australian states are now following with similar legislation, and I hope other jurisdictions around the world will join the momentum. And for other plastic products, I hope we see both recycling schemes, but also look at manufacturers who use biodegradable plastic of the type that I understand has been developed here in Britain by Symphony Environmental. We also, in South Australia, introduced a network of 19 marine parks with 83 sanctuary zones stretched along the coastline. These areas, similar in concept to national parks, protect vital fish breeding, feeding, nursery, refuge areas for our fish, other marine animals and plants. 
So we now have one of the best fisheries management systems in the world, and one of the main purposes of our marine parks is to contribute long-term to replenishing fish stocks outside the zones. At the national level, we need to see countries, particularly vulnerable ones, push much harder through the UN's International Maritime Organization to put climate policies and emission reduction standards higher on its agenda. The IMO's headquarters are here in London. Most people have never heard of it, even though it is the global standard setting authority for the safety, security, and environmental performance of international shipping. It has 172 member states, including countries that are most vulnerable to sea level rise. And I mention this because international shipping is a major polluter, contributing as much CO2 to the atmosphere as a major industrial nation such as Germany. But pressure must be put on the IMO by member countries to agree to tougher emission standards to make shipping more energy efficient and less polluting. We also need international action, this follows on from, from Jose Ramos Horta's mention before, to prevent the practice of developed nations paying developing nations, mainly in Asia, to accept plastic and other waste that is carried by ships and barges across the world to be dumped sometimes illegally. Developing countries must unite to work on the technology to clean up these floating islands of garbage. Now, in to conclude, despite all of this, I remain on most days optimistic. I'm pleased that investors such as major pension funds with trillions of dollars worth of assets, plus some sovereign wealth funds and banks are increasingly divesting or stopping further investments in the fossil fuel industry and instead choosing sustainable investments that they now see as bankable and profitable. And that's what the Sustainable Markets Initiative is about, and we should all support it. The Climate Group, which I'm involved with, now has more than 200 sub-national governments and a similar number of major corporations making measurable commitments to reduce their emissions. And this is also gaining real momentum. So in closing, I hope you put pressure on your respective governments to ensure that any post-COVID-19 recovery packages given to industry are directly linked to sustainable economic outcomes that reduce emissions. We've got to avoid at all costs, repeating what happened uh, after, during and after the global financial crisis when progress on climate action was put on hold. And it's also important to ensure that when governments and corporations proudly tell you that they will have zero emissions by 2050, that they state their measurable short and medium term targets and spell out how they're going to meet them. In the 60s, many countries in Europe, including here in Britain, cleaned up their grossly polluted rivers and air pollution that produced choking smog full of toxic fumes and particles. We can do the same for our seas, which like our forests, are the lungs of our planet, but they're also the producers of much of our food, the focus of much of our tourism and recreation and our vital uh, trade routes. Thank you for listening to me and for allowing me to participate. Dr. Ran, for your very important talk. Uh, that is true that the uh, shipping industry is a big issue, is a big problem around the world. You are completely right. 90% of the trade uh, that are moving uh, on the sea uh, affect a lot, not only your region, but around the world, all regions. It's very important to, to know that not only the industry is affecting the quality of waters or the quality of uh, what we have uh, as uh, production in the sea, but also they, have, they are affecting a lot with, with so many issues like uh, CO2 emissions, chemical pollution, noise pollution that uh, until now with uh, nobody is uh, talking about the noise pollution that is affecting a lot of marine mammals, the waste in general that you were talking about that, and also the impact of climate change and the global warming on the small island states. That is really very strong, very important because we saw already in many uh, environmental meetings around the world 
that the small island, they are suffering a lot with this issue. Thank you so very much. We will uh, speak a little uh, further with uh, all the, the speakers that we have in this panel about this very important issue. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Rang. And now we give the floor to uh, Her Excellency Marta Delgado, please. Marta, are you there? Marta? Marta Delgado? No? Somewhere we have Marta, somewhere there, please. Hello, Ms. Marta Delgado is just attending a brief uh, phone call. She'll be back in a minute. Okay, we wait some more. Um, yeah. I'm not okay. sure. One minute, uh, she said one minute. Okay. Um, also, yeah, if we can take this time, if you have any questions for anyone, please type them in the chat. And also don't forget about posting on social media at um, the pop movement on all the different um, social media platforms. Um, if Marta is not available, I would suggest uh, that if uh, His Excellency Sir David King is available, perhaps we could let him get started. Okay, thank you, Marissa. Uh, Sir David King, are you ready for your talk? Yes, I am. Okay, can, can you take the floor, please? Thank you very much. So let me thank start you so much. By, let me start by saying in particular thank you to Ash Pachari for the invitation. I feel very honored to address this uh, critically important meeting. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yes. yeah. thank you. How, how that happened. Okay, so basically a very big thank you to Ash Pachari for inviting me to this critically important meeting uh, and giving me a chance to talk to so many wonderful young people. The future is in your hands and we really need you to act in every possible way to see that we move the, the planet forward in a safer way. So first of all, let me say just something about the, the state of the oceans. The reason why we've just heard Mike Rann talking about the uh, pollution of the oceans is because of our human attitude towards what we call the natural world. So I just want to first of all say, actually, do we treat ourselves as apart from the natural world? <clears throat> Excuse me, apart from the natural world or a part of the natural world? So all of our language at the moment is built around the idea that we are separate, that somehow we are not a part of it. Of course, we co-evolved on this planet with every aspect of that natural world. We are a part of it, but we have pushed ourselves into this position where we feel we are above it all. And this year, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we are suffering from not fully understanding our interaction with the, as being part of that natural world. And of course, the bigger threat is from the, the destruction of the oceans in the way that this is continuing. There is no such thing as waste in the natural world until we came along and developed this notion that we can wrap things up and throw them away. In the natural world, everything is recycled. And it's taken us a very long time to learn that critically important business of recycling. I'm delighted to hear that Mike Rand took South Australia into a banning of, of plastic bags, etc. I'm senior strategy advisor to the government of Rwanda, and I'm very pleased to say I believe Rwanda was the first country in the world to ban plastic bags. The, the, the initiation of these exercises need not be in the developed world. They can happen in the emerging economies. Rwanda, first of all, banned plastic bags back in 2010, and now they've banned all single-use plastics. So it's, it's, it's an advance in a, a society 
that really is gaining in every single way from the respect that people are playing, paying to their environment. Now, of course, what, what I really want to focus on is what, how we can manage to change the situation. I, I refer now to what China did in introducing a new word. I think the English translation is simply eco-civilization. And this was introduced in the Communist Party constitution in 2012 in China, and it's now part of the government constitution in China. And eco-civilization is interpreted as meaning that we develop our well-being alongside the well-being of ecosystems. We can't separate one from the other because actually we're all a part of that ecosystem. Now, until we get that into our heads, that we need to treat ourselves as part of the ecosystems, we will continue using the ecosystems as a, uh, a disposable. Whereas, of course, we totally depend on it, as do all other living creatures. Now, what I, I want to move on to is the, the question of rising sea levels and the question of climate change, because this quite simply is the biggest challenge the world is faced with today. Let's take the, the Arctic Sea. The Arctic Sea is now 50% exposed to sunlight during the Arctic summer every year. And, and that level of exposure is growing. And of course it never was. There were, there were explorers who walked across to the, to the North Pole. You can't do that anymore. You have to swim there. So what, what, what is this, what's the consequence of this for the rest of the planet? Well, let's just remember that blue sea absorbs sunlight very effectively. White ice reflects it very effectively. So of course, we've now disturbed the planetary climate system by creating a hot spot in the middle of the North Pole in the polar summer. And the result of this is that average through the year, the whole of the Arctic Circle region is now heating up at two and a half times the rate of the rest of the planet. Now, why does this affect every one of us, particularly those who are island nations? And here in Britain, we are indeed also an island nation but also anyone who's living on a city that's at a coastline. 80% of our cities were at coastline. Why, why does it affect all of us? Because sitting in the Arctic Circle is Greenland and Greenland ice is now beginning to melt. And it's also following the same pattern as the Arctic ice. It's, it's following not a linear depletion, but a, a plus linear. In other words, there's a very big positive feedback in the loss of, of the ice from Greenland. And when all of the ice in Greenland melts, sea levels will rise by seven meters. Now, that's not gonna happen quickly. It's taken hundreds and hundreds of thousands and millions of years to build all that ice up. But at the same time as the Arctic is melting, the Antarctic is becoming destabilized by the warming of the ocean below the, the bits of the Arctic, uh, Antarctic ice that are sitting on the ocean. And we're in danger of seeing very large chunks of ice entering the ocean. And one of these chunks could easily push sea levels up just with one chunk, could push the sea levels up by half to one meter. So we're talking about a possibility that we are risking the future of civilization. And the reason I say it as dramatically as that is because moving forward in time, it's not very long before one of the biggest cities in the world, Calcutta in India, is no longer going to be livable because of not just rising sea levels, storms at sea causing the incursion of water further and further inland, and Calcutta is already being flooded quite frequently. When it's flooded every year, then of course you can no longer live there. And across the water, from uh, Calcutta is, is Bangladesh. Bangladesh, two thirds of that country is no longer going to be livable. No longer being livable. And as we therefore move forward in time, it's not a long stretch before we get to the position 
where perhaps 160 million people in that region are looking for somewhere else to live. Where do they go? Does that cause a destabilization in our planetary economic system, in our global living system? Yes, it does. We've now got a taster from COVID-19 of what a destabilization looks like. The economies of the world are in a very peculiar state now. Imagine what Europe has managed with the migration that has occurred from uh, Northern Africa, that, that has destabilized Europe in a very strange way. This, this is caused by a few million refugees. Talk about 150 million, you're looking at a global disaster in a very large scale. Now, the, the problem is, we reached a very good agreement in Paris in, in 2015. I think it was a good agreement. We said 1.5 degrees, not two degrees. That was a decision that was made in the, at the Pacific Island Forum. I was there representing Britain and I managed to push the British government into supporting the islanders in their desire to see 1.5 and not two. We're nowhere near managing the 1.5 degrees. Greenhouse gases are still increasing more rapidly than before. And now it's actually methane that is going up very rapidly. And methane is going up rapidly, largely, not because of the methane leakage from fossil fuel usage, but more from more farming to produce livestock, to produce meat, to meet the demands of a growing middle class across the world. I'm just going to end this with saying, how do we act to manage this all together? And I was delighted when I heard Mike Rand say that a climate group has been formed with 200 sub-national groups. I'm now going to tell you, we're calling for a global climate alliance of nations and states to come together under the heading of climate repair at the COP meeting, COP26, which now will be probably in November 2021, and, and give their allegiance to the notion of climate repair. And by climate repair, I mean three things. One is deep and rapid emissions reduction. Two is greenhouse gas removal. We've put too much into the atmosphere already at a rate of about 30 to 40 billion tons a year, high, highly scaled up to bring the level down from roughly 500 parts per million, including methane today, to 350 parts per million in about 30 years time. If we can get an alliance under that series of challenges, then I think our civilization has a chance and all of you young people will find that you have a good place to live on. Thank you so much for giving me this chance to talk to you. Thank you so very much, Sir David King, for your very, very important and uh, I want to say that you are right. I will be very quickly now, but uh, I want to say that the first thing that we need to accept if what you said at the beginning, we are a part of this world or we are a part, we belong to this world. That is so very important because as far as we don't think that we are a part of the problem, we will never be a solution of that problem. Thank you so very much for this. And uh, I will give uh, the floor to Mr. Andrew um, Rhodes Espinosa, that he's a special envoy for uh, the Ministry of Affairs in Mexico. And instead of uh, Ms. Marta Delgado, that sh she should go for a very important meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Please take the floor. Thank you, thank, thank you very much. and. Um... Uh, please receive from Under Secretary Delgado uh, her regrets for her absence. She was literally summoned to a very important meeting with the Chancellor Ebrard in Mexico related to COVID-19. We and all uh, acknowledge the, 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 the context and, and the moment that we're going through. So please receive uh, her apologies for not being able to join us today. But believe me, uh, uh, Under Secretary Delgado's heart is very close to the ocean. Uh, related, related to that, uh, and probably on, on, on the element of positive news, just to let you know that today it was released a joint, a joint statement 
on the role of the sustainable ocean economy in a post-COVID-19 world uh, from the high-level panel on ocean sustainable economy that I will speak about uh, later in, in this message. So, um, as you know, Mexico, due to its cultural and natural diversity, recognizes its role and responsibility for the security of the planet, for life as, as we know it. This represents, without any doubt, both a privilege and a potential for a sustainable development for the, of the country in the coming years. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of uh, Marta Delgado and uh, the Mexican government, it is an honor and a, uh, to address this audience, especially on uh, a very important World Oceans Day. Mexico is a country with unique marine characteristics. It is one of the few mega diverse countries that possesses uh, littorals in both the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. We have one and a half times more maritime surface than land territory, and it's the only country in the world that possesses an exclusive area, the Gulf, the Gulf of California. As uh, everybody knows, very close to hearts of many and without uh, very close to my heart. As stated before, Mexico has a high responsibility for safeguarding its biological and cultural heritage for future generations. The country has more than 11,000 kilometers of coastline, where almost 18% of the country population lives in. These communities and their livelihoods are directly benefited by the ocean, but at the same time, highly affected by the impacts of climate change and marine ecosystem degradation, as has been said before. Marine biodiversity and its natural capacity for providing ecosystem services is being affected as a result of several human-related pressures. This unsustainable use of biodiversity and oceanic resources will undoubtedly have great implications for present and future human health, society, and economy. COVID-19 is without any doubt the best example of this. Because all of the above and all of this, it is necessary to implement an oceanic sustainable economy and an integrated ocean management with a collaborative focus based on an equitable distribution of benefits that allows to protect the ocean and its biodiversity, prevents its degradation, and boost the prosperity of the most vulnerable coastal communities on the planet. There is no doubt that we're going through unprecedented times that force us to rethink our future. In these times, we need to think about the new role of nature in a post-pandemic recovery. The recovery strategy, strategy for everyone's benefit must aim for environmental and social sustainability at a long term. In this sense, it is vital to see the oceans as a solution for the ongoing crisis. The ocean can be an indispensable resource for guaranteeing food security, providing jobs, and boosting the world's economy. The ocean produces oxygen, stores carbon, health, produces food and medicines, offers space for economic activities, generates jobs, and facilitates international commerce and product transport. The ocean is critically important to our global economy. Collectively, it is estimated that the ocean-based industries and activities contribute hundreds of millions of jobs, approximately 2.5 trillion of the global economy each year, making it the world's seventh largest economy when compared with natural gross domestic products. The ocean is on the front lines of the battle against climate change. It already has absorbed 93% of the heat trap by human-generated carbon dioxide emissions. It absorbs from 25 to 30% of annual carbon dioxide emissions that would otherwise remain in the atmosphere and increase global warming. Yet, it has become a victim of climate change, putting everyone at risk. Actually, a new report of the High-Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy states that the ocean could help reduce as much as one fifth of the greenhouse gas emissions needed for 2050 in order to reduce global temperature rise below 1.5 Celsius. Additionally, marine and coastal tourism was the second largest ocean-related economy sector in 2010, next to offshore oil and gas. Ocean tourism is projected to be the top contributor of ocean industries by 2030 in terms of production value when it will account for 26% of the ocean-based economy, compared with a 21% for oil and gas. Ocean tourism, global direct value added, was estimated at 390 billion 
in 2010, directly providing 7 million full jobs. In addition, the ocean is a source of recreation for millions of people in the developed and developing world. Furthermore, the ocean can provide up to six times more food than in the present, which will represent more than two thirds the animal protein needed to feed the future world population. Mexico is proud to be part of the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy and committed to invest in nature based solutions to protect and restore our ecosystems to increase its resilience to the effects of climate change. The Ocean Panel is a unique initiative of 14 serving heads of government committed to catalyzing bold pragmatic solutions for ocean health and wealth that support sustainable development goals and build a, a better future for people on the planet. The panel is supported by an expert group, an advisory group, and a secretariat. Together, these countries compromise 30% of the world coastlines and exclusive economic zones, and 20% of all the fisheries and shipping fleets. By working with governments, experts, and stakeholders from around the world, the Ocean Panel aims to promote solutions in order to achieve a sustainable ocean economy, as well as a new relation among people and the ocean that allows to protect effectively, produce sustainably, and prosper equitably. The Ocean Panel has commissioned a series of blue papers to explore pressing challenges at the nexus of the ocean and the economy. These papers summarize the latest science and state-of-the-art thinking about innovative ocean solutions in the technology, policy, governance, and finance realms that can help accelerate and move into a more sustainable and prosperous relationship with the ocean. At the UN General Assembly last September, and in particular at the launch of the climate change report from the high level panel, our Ministry for Foreign Affairs, Marcelo Ebrard, announced two relevant commitments of Mexico regarding the ocean panel. Priority, giving a priority to local coastal communities and making sure that the ocean ecosystem services continue to be a source of well being and resilience. First commitment was related to the expansion and strengthening. Uh, the effectiveness of our fishing refugia areas, which are a very important tool for achieving sustainable marine ecosystems and coastal communities. These areas are perfectly deli delimited areas that have the purpose of conserving fishing resources and contributing to the development as well as the protection of ecosystems. In addition, this will allow local fishing communities to increase their productivity and enhance their sense of belonging to the respective delimited refuge area. They also represent an important strategy for protecting and conserving the marine diversity, including fishing and other associate species, and provide, as you know, important ecological benefits. They promote connectivity among MPAs. And on the other hand, they are very useful uh, for socioeconomic matters. They increase catch, volume, and value. The second commitment consists in strengthening our efforts on coral reef restorations especially on the Caribbean Sea. I must say that the Ministry for, 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 for Agriculture and Rural Development, and in particular the National Commission for Fisheries and Aquaculture, together with the National Institute for Fisheries and Aquaculture here in Mexico, play a fundamental role as they mainstream biodiversity into those productive sectors. In order to promote a sustainable ocean economy in Mexico, other actions and recommendations from the Ocean Panel and appropriate to our country priorities will be implemented in the near near future. For example, we are already designing a, a knowledge platform which will allow to provide a system for the follow-up monitoring and report for healthy oceans indicators related to the ocean panel recommendation. It is fundamental to rethink our policies of biodiversity protection and sustainable use of natural resources in a just and equitable manner. Otherwise, the ocean will continue to be affected and biodiversity will continue to decrease with important ecological, social, and economic repercussions in the future. Fortunately, Mexico has the necessary capacities in order to implement an integral and sustainable use of coast and the ocean, including strategies for equitable distribution of ocean benefits. Only this way, we will achieve ocean protection and prosperity for our present and future communities. We recognize that there is no time to spare and ladies and gentlemen, you can count that Mexico will do its part. Thank you very much, and thank you for this brief, brief message. 
Over to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Andrew Rhodes. Uh, I will invite you to stay with us until the end of this session to be in the question and answers uh, part, please. We are going a little late, and uh, I will ask to Dr. Shonali Pashori <clears throat> to reach us now with her talk, please. Shonali, can you take the, the floor? Yes, hello everyone, and uh, greetings to your excellencies, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, our pop stars, and the youth. Uh, it's a real privilege to be able to speak to you today. I know we are running a little over time, and uh, as a lot of the points that I wanted to make have already been made by the excellent speakers before me, uh, I, will, I will restrict my intervention to mentioning two uh, studies that I think have great importance in the discussions that we're having here today. So one of these is actually a study that was done by colleagues of mine that I was also involved in uh, at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. And what this study was really trying to do was really to understand how um, vulnerabilities vary across the globe, not only to uh, you know, potential exposure of global, uh, global risks, but also to understand how multiple risks are overlaid and how hotspots emerge that are areas where these multiple risks exist. So in this particular study, what we really tried to understand was not only the severity of climate change and the hazards that emerge from that, but also what is the spatial distribution of populations, how this will change over time, and what is vulnerability and capacity to prepare and manage risks. So in this particular study, we looked at indicators related to energy risks, land risks, and water risks. And we looked at this over a period of the next century, focusing really for up to the middle of the next of the century, that is up to 2050. And uh, what we found, what we concluded from this was that although the global exposure to multiple risks in terms of uh, land area, global land area, will be a very small fraction. But in fact, the risks to human populations will be very large because much of this global area that is hotspots of multiple risks occur in coastal areas and other areas of high population density. So in fact, areas where you will see increased heat stress, water stress, and variability up to 2050 will be these coastal areas and areas of high population density where hotspots will emerge. And what we also realized is in the process of this research that in fact, the risks, the population that are exposed to these risks will double between an end of the century temperature rise of two degrees as opposed to 1.5 degrees. So in other words, if we were to restrict temperature rise to less than 1.5 degrees, by the end of the century, we can really halve the population dependent on or exposed to these multiple risks. So this is an extremely important thing because we also found that of course these areas are not equitably distributed over the globe. In fact, Asian regions and uh, African regions and coastal Asian and African regions in particular will be areas where over 75% of the population could be living in these areas of multiple risks. So the whole equity dimension of the changes that we're looking for are extremely important in any of the management that we think about as we go forward. The only other point I'd like to make is related to another very important report of the ocean panel that was mentioned already that came out last year. So this particular report of the ocean panel, this high level panel for the oceans was on looking at possible 
oceans-related mitigation options. We've talked a lot about what we are doing wrong. We've talked a lot about potential impacts for the economy of these uh, ocean-related changes that we're observing. But there are also very important mitigation options that the oceans afford us. And this particular report highlighted six such mitigation options that can have a significant dent in reducing our emissions as we go forward. And I just briefly talk about these six options. So the biggest one is really ocean-based renewable energy. So in fact, there's a huge potential to use the oceans in both things like wind, offshore wind, uh, tidal energy, and um, other such options that can really help to reduce emissions in the future. Uh, and in addition, there is the issue of ocean-based transport, which we've heard about from several of the speakers today. Decarbonizing our ocean freight transport and passenger transport can be another important way of mitigating emissions from the, that are ocean-related in some way. Coastal and marine ecosystems are another way of really improving emissions, reducing emissions by really reducing our uh, uh, salty marshes, restoring mangroves, sea grass beds, and seaweeds. Fisheries and aquaculture are another important area. Shifting diets away from land-based meat to fisheries and having sustainable fisheries uh, and uh, uh, and mariculture can be a very important way also of meeting the growing food demand for protein in particular and reducing emissions at the same time. Uh, finally, the, uh, the final uh, um, mitigation option that was highlighted by this particular study was the issue of carbon storage in the seabed. Of course, this is an area where we don't have much experience yet, where a lot of investment and research is still required, and also understanding the impacts of this is still very, very important. However, these options provide a huge potential for us to reduce up to 4 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per annum by 2030, and more than two and a half times that by 2050. So in fact, these options together could reduce our emissions gap by more than 20% by the middle of the century if we were to implement these smartly. Um, I, I really um, would not like to take more of your time now because I know it's very late in different parts of the world where you're joining from, but I think we need to remember these very important options the oceans afford us to also reduce emissions in, in addition to improving the equity, the equity in, in, in the vulnerability of people and reducing impacts to uh, ocean-related changes, climate changes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shamali. Norma, um, do you like to keep going? You're muted now if you're speaking, sorry. Okay, now is good. Thank you very much, Shanali, for your talk. That is a very important issue. For me, it's one of the main issues about uh, against the climate change that is mitigation. Uh, we will certainly talk about that in uh, the session of question and answers. I invite you to stay with us, please. And uh, I feel sorry for the time. Thank you so much, Shanali. And now I will give the floor to Maria Jax, please. Can you be uh, a little brief, Maria? Please. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. We Perfect. Hear you. <laughs> Perfect. So hi, I'm Maria Jax, student of chemical engineering in the University Iberoamericana in Mexico City. And I am passionate about the ocean and the environment. Since I was a little child, I went two to three times a year to the ocean, ocean, and all my favorite memories have been there. So it really breaks my heart to see all these threats to the ocean and the planet and ourselves. So man, many people would ask themselves, why am I talking here on an ocean summit if I live in the city? 
but many people doesn't really understand the link that we all have in common with the ocean. So today I want to talk really quick about some of these links that we have all taken for we that we all have taken for granted or we don't even want to see. First of all, what we eat. Do we really know where it comes from? When you go to a restaurant and you eat a tuna sushi, oh, did you know that the bluefin tuna is an endangered species? In the case of Mexico, for each 10 kilograms of fish, six kilograms comes from illegal fishing. Do you ask yourself this before eating it? Overfishing can really have a big economic impact. Two, our footprint. It doesn't matter where you are, you are consuming all the time, food, clothes, accessories, and more. Do you ask yourself all, all that's behind this? Water consumption, energy consumption, people producing it, transport, all these contribute to climate change and the excess of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. CO2 is really dangerous for oceans because when it gets in contact with water, it reacts and gets acid. So the pH decreases and this affects all the species, especially corals, and this affects the tourism and the local economy. Third, this is related to point two, two. Do you think that you are really being clean by throwing your garbage in the dump? All the things that we consume don't disappear magically. It has to end somewhere. Maybe in an open air dumpster or in the ocean. We have seen with the present crisis that medical material end up in our oceans. We have to be more conscient each time we use a single use plastic or material. I could talk for hours about all these problems, but what I, what I really want to say today is that we need the ocean. It's an important source of food and an amazing source of biodiversity. The expansion of protected areas for marine biodiversity and existing policies and treaties that encourage responsible use of ocean resources are still insufficient to combat the adverse effects. Individual change is fundamental, but collective change is even more powerful. So I thank Pop Movement and Pop Oceans for this incredible space and motivate us to find solutions because together we can. Thank you so much, Maria, for speaking. Dr. Norma, do you have any closing words for your panel? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Summer. Well, I thank all the speakers, brilliant speakers that we had. Thank you so much. Certainly, we will take all your, your talks, all your experience, and all your statements that you made already and the information that you gave us. We are sure that we will take a, a, a very strong note on that and we will send you in, a, in some days. Thank you so very much, Summer. Thank you so very much for all our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, again, thanks to all the speakers who joined us. That was our final uh, session. Now we're going to try to take a few questions. I know we're running quite behind, so we're just going to answer a few questions and um, by, sorry, excuse me, uh, Carolyn Ryder, an ocean enthusiast, contributor to the National Geographic and former conservation special, specialist at San Mateo County, California, now at the Alumni Association at Stanford University, will moderate the question and answer question session. Sorry. Carolyn, uh, could you please begin with a few questions? Perfect. Thank you so much, Summer. And yeah, thank you so much again to all of our incredible speakers we've had for your inspiring words and all of your impactful work in this field. So we've already had a lot of positive comments coming in from the audience, so we really want to truly thank you for everything. Um, some quick logistical housekeeping. We already have had a number of questions coming in, so we're going to address those first. But if you do have any other questions separately, please submit them in the chat and we will follow up with you later. So we're really gonna to try to keep this um, brief as possible, maybe 15 minutes tops, just to be mindful of your time. 
And as Veda mentioned earlier, a lot of our speakers have had to log off because of the time difference. So thank you everyone again. Our first question is regarding CO2 regulation. Now this is being prioritized by the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we wanna know if the same thing is being done for water pollution in other countries. So hopefully you can address that maybe for your own country or another country that you've worked with. For this question, how about we start with His Excellency Mike Ran and then follow up with Vice Minister Andrew Espinosa. Caroline, can you repeat the question? Yes. So the first question is around CO2 regulation. And since this is an issue that is being prioritized by the UN and other countries, um, this participant is wondering if the same thing is being done for water pollution in your country. So first, can we try um, His Excellency Mike Ran? or Vice Minister Andrew Espinosa, if one of you could address this question. Okay, probably I can address it. Um, is it okay with you? Perfect, thanks. Okay, so as you know, many countries are updating their national determined contributions this year uh, that will be presented probably in the next meetings of the COP once obviously they occur. So it's very important that everyone, uh, it doesn't matter if you're a young student, if you're into politics, if you're in academics, it's important to follow the process of the NDCs of each country. That's fundamental. Uh, follow the consultations and hopefully try to uh, 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 put some of your, of, of, of your concerns in, in, let's say, the, 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 the reductions and the targets towards it. And obviously the adaptation and export. So that's, that's one element. Following that, logic, the same logic of the NDCs, then we can move to the, to the, the, to the quality and quantity of, of, of pollution on, 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 on water and oceans. And every country has its own legislation. And it's very important to identify within that legislation the leverage and the key entry points to contribute to obviously legislation and, and, and policy without, without any doubt that local action and organization is fundamental to tackle the problem. Just to let you know that also in the high level panel for sustainable ocean economy, I believe last week or two weeks ago, it's complicated with the shutdown and locks that is going on. Uh, there was a launch of, of also a blue paper related to ocean pollution. I invite all participants to go to the ocean panel webpage and download the report related to pollution. So again, it's important to be active and proactive and identifying the key entry points for the national legislation of each country, because at the end of the day, uh, conventions and treaties get to some point. Then you have to identify the key entry points within the, the national policy and try to figure out how to affect those. So three, three elements, NDCs, climate change, look for your local legislation and how you can entry and input into it. And finally, get informed. And in that sense, follow the ocean panel activity. Uh, it, it has been relevant. And I, I just want to highlight that uh, again, there was a joint statement uh, launched by the high level panel um, chiefs of state it's of state, so please uh, follow it through. It's, it's, it's an interesting joint statement. And uh, never, never, never lose your passion and, and hope. Perfect, thank you. I think that's great advice for all of us on the call, to never lose your passion. Great, and I think, um, His Excellency, your, Mike Rand, you were muted previously. Do you wanna unmute to answer the question about water pollution in your country? I think there's an error going on with the mute function. So I will move on to our next question. All right, our second question is around plastic use. Um, Your Excellency Lawrence Gonsi, you mentioned dealing with plastic should be a priority. 
So I'd like to ask you what do you think governments can do to prevent plastic from entering the oceans? And also, do you think this is an issue that can be tackled during a crisis or a pandemic such as now? Hello, are you hearing me? Yes. Yeah, yes, okay. Well, there are a number of initiatives and some of them have already been mentioned, I think mostly by M Michael Rand. Um, uh, the initiative to, to reduce the use of plastic bags, the initiative to change from disposable plastic uh, bottles uh, back to, uh, the, or the, to, to reusable um, uh, containers, etc. In the case of Malta, for example, until a few years ago, we, um, most of our soft, well, the two major soft drinks companies in Malta, being an island, um, used to use glass uh, bottles, which then used to be collected. There was an incentive for consumers to return the bottles. The bottles would be uh, washed, uh, reused, and reused, I think, for about 12 different cycles. So you can imagine. Um, the impact uh, that that had in the sense that um, plastic just, just did not make sense at the time. However, unfortunately, a decision was taken way back um, by these industries to move on to PET. And the result is, is that um, uh, we are now surrounded by mountains of plastic and nobody really knows what to do with this. But bottom line, I think I would, I would latch on to what was said by one of the speakers, it must start from us. Each one of us uh, must make a choice and must decide to go for the items that, are, that have the least impact on our environment, um, um, uh, not just where plastic is concerned, but for everything else. So if it starts from us, but then I would suggest strongly that our young um, generation pushes all the necessary buttons that are needed to push in order to get our politicians, in order to get our decision makers and decision takers to really go for a dramatic change. I think I honestly believe that this can be done, but it's up to us to really shoulder the responsibility we have and insist that this change, this change needs to take place. Terrific. Hello. Thank you so much. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, it's Mike Perfect. Rand here. We've, had, oh, we've, had, we've just had a technological breakdown here, but just on that issue and following, up, following on from Lawrence, mm -hmm. in the 1970s, uh, my state um, in 1976 introduced container deposit legislation that we then updated a few years ago. And what it means is that there is literally no litter because in terms of containers, so every glass bottle, plastic bottle, uh, cartons, paper cartons for milk, whole range of things. We pay people for every item 10 cents that they bring to a recycling centre. Now, as a result of this, lots of clubs, sports clubs, Boy Scouts, Girl Guides, they go around collecting these because they can raise money. And then meanwhile, the recycling centres recycle these bottles. So, you know, every single bottle of beer, every single... Uh, Coca-Cola can, there's also cans as well, you get a 10 cent refund if you send it in, if you take it into recycling. So this has had a number of effects. One, incredibly clean roadsides, incredibly clean waterways and beaches and, and, and the sea in terms of those things. But also at the same time, it's created a multi-million dollar recycling industry that employs one hell of a lot of people. Now it's interesting, so that was introduced in 76. It's just starting to be introduced in other states around uh, Australia. And again, you have to put up with a whole range of big companies coming out and saying this will destroy the industry, just the same as the plastic bag ban in 2008. And of course, it's rubbish. What they're saying is rubbish because none of those things happened and the public love it. So politicians, won't lose votes in doing so. So one of the things in terms of you know, plastic, in terms of cans and everything else I've mentioned, here's a way that lots of jurisdictions around the world can make a serious difference, including cities as well as um, states, provinces and regions. Great, thank you so much for sharing. All right, so our next question is, um, 
what have young people done in your country and what specifically can young people do to have some sort of a meaningful impact? So I'd really like to open this up to any one of our speakers who have been on the call and if you could please limit your response to about a minute or so. Um, let's begin with Sir David King, if you wouldn't mind um, answering this question. Do you mind quickly repeating it? I, I was dealing with Not some, at all. Yeah. Perfect. So the question is asking about what young people have done in your country and also what specifically can they do in order to have some sort of meaningful impact? Well, that's a very, very good question. And I would say young people in Britain and across Europe and many parts of the world are playing a critical role. If, if, we, if we go into schools, um, uh, young people from the age of 10 upwards are very much engaged with the problems we're now discussing. I don't think this is something that needs to be stimulated in a very formal way because it just emerges from the teaching they're getting from their parents talking to them. Uh, but what, what can happen? Uh, and of course, we, we've got this wonderful example of a Swedish girl, Greta Thunberg, who has su had such a major impact around the world. So I, I think the, the future is with these young people, people like yourself know that you are going to be around for a good deal longer than I am. And the world is not going to be a good place unless we can turn this around. So I'm always keen to work with young people, talk to young people. I go into schools, I go into universities, where, wherever I'm invited and can do it, I will go. Thank you so much. Anybody else want to answer that call about how young people can have a positive impact? Yes, this is Andrew. I'm oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, I, I agree with, with uh, what David just mentioned. Uh, also highlight, for instance, a very concrete ex uh, uh, example in Mexico related to the Convention on Biological Diversity. There is obviously youth groups uh, related to it. And at least in Mexico, the network of youth related to the Convention on Biological Diversity has been very active. Um, not only uh, working with the, the, the official delegation, uh, reviewing its recommendations and obviously elements and inputs to it, but also very active on social media. Uh, they even have a, 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 a World Ocean Day event later today with youth. So, so, so my comment will be, it's very important for them to get engaged. It's very important for them to manage social media. Everything can, you can change a policy of a country with a tweet nowadays. So it's very important for youth to get vocal. But above all, even if they're active, even their social media, it's fundamental that their arguments, the, 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 the elements that they communicate are science-based, are robust, are technical. They need, they need that, uh, uh, that, 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 that uh, uh, certainty of data. No? Uh, so get engaged, get vocal, but above all, get uh, robust technical scientific arguments for your positions. Thank you. Thank you Maybe so if I could just make a comment on that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I totally agree with Sir David. The best questions I ever got as premier came going to schools and and they can put you they can they can ask you some hard ones and also we set up a number of things for instance we put solar panels onto the roofs of hundreds of schools and it was integrated into the curriculum for sort of environment and uh, and for maths so i'd go into schools and even little kids would proudly tell me how much uh, solar power was being produced that day and they had all of these charts to show it through the different uh, seasons. We also set up a youth conservation corps for young unemployed people who, through the process of working in national parks, uh, big uh, uh, reforestation programs, also gain skills and credits that they could articulate in order to get apprenticeships and so on. So I think you're absolutely right. It's the young people you have just got to get involved politically. Ultimately, it's about, as I said during my presentation, 
you've got the you know the power when you vote to be able to make sure you don't vote for people who are climate deniers. And I, get, I encourage people to get involved in political parties and get involved, get, you know, seek meetings with their local members of parliament and representatives. There's a, you know, there's a, there's much greater power that you have than many people realize. Thank you so much. I think that's a perfect segue into our last question. It's just directed at the youth speakers on this call. If you want to go ahead and answer what you think in particular youth can do, or if there's anything that you would like to share to some of the leaders on this call of um, creating that lasting impact. So maybe we can start off with um, Caroline and go from there. And Lauren uh, Sandberg. Perfect. Uh, so um, are we answering, sorry, are we answering this question or the question about what may motivates you to be a champion for ocean health? Either Anyone? one. Yep, if okay. you want to answer either one real quick. Um, so I'll answer the one about what youth can do. I think that, well, if you, you, I think that youth should start in their own community and then they can branch out from there. Because if you look into it, there's tons of groups and probably your own community that you don't know about. Um, like I know in my community, there was lots of groups that I've just recently been in communication with that I never knew existed before. So I think the first step is just to research groups in your area and then you can get involved with, the, with them. And then you can even start your own projects too, but just reaching out to experts and like there's all these experts on this call, um, but local experts are a great way to start too. And then I'll also um, talk about how, like why I'm motivated or how I'm motivated. And lots of times I am motivated just by other youth because I see other youth leaders um, taking action and having great successes and that just motivates me to move along and push along with my own projects. Um, and then, yeah, do you want to go um, Yeah, I think something that motivates me too is just like when I can see actual change being made um, and like even small successes can be very inspiring and they can lead us to take action on a bigger scale. So even if we start with something small, that inspires me to go even bigger from there. And when I see that we can really make a difference, then I'm more motivated to actually make that change happen. And then um, one thing that I'd just like to tell everyone and also political leaders specifically listening today is that the time to act is right now. We can't waste any more time to take action on and make changes. And we must drastically reduce our greenhouse gas emissions before it's too late. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Caroline and Lauren. Um, would either Summer, Anna, or Maria have anything else they'd like to add before we um, have Ash close? Sure, um, I can. I would also like to address the question of what youth can do. I think um, from what I've seen working from youth in Mexico and everything, people sometimes don't realize how much um, like power they have, right? They, maybe they have a really good idea they, that they would like to implement and they don't really know how to. Like the like Lauren and Caroline said, they don't reach out to older people who have more experience. So I think doing that is really important. And also using the different platforms that exist to take projects forward. For example, Pop Movement and the Pop, Pop Ocean that hosted this <laughs> event today are a great way for people to be able to take their projects forward. I also think it's really important for the youth to stay informed of what is happening, what really motivates them to make a change and everything. For example, in Mexico now, 75% um, of the budget for um, natural protected areas was taken away. And I think it's very important for the youth to um, be informed of what's happening, what can be done, and in the future, make the right decisions on who to vote for once, like for the ones that are 18 and older, and really take into consideration that are people that, like Mike Graham said, they're not climate deniers and they really have environmental protection in their high priority list. I just have one quick thing to add. I also think something really important to help youth get inspired is just to connect with other youth and just talk to other youth around the world and see if they're doing any project or, or if they have any ideas for projects that you could work together on and implement in your different communities around the world and just make a more global network of youth because I know we're all going through the same exact thing and it, it varies on the different effects that we're uh, experiencing, but we can all relate to each other. And I think we connecting, like we can meet people through these types of calls and through social media. I think that's very important to um, take action that way. Thanks so much, Summer. Ah, uh, sorry. <laughs> 
I would like to add something. Uh, I think that collective action is always more powerful than individual. So first of all, I would recommend to find people that are also motivated on the same objective. And secondly, I think that intergeneration interaction is really important because young people, we like to act right now. And old people uh, like more like the information, the scientific uh, background. So I think it's, um, we have to have both. So maybe to have this interaction with all the young people, it, it really helps to equilibrate like the action and to really be informed. Great, thank you so much. Thank you so much everybody, really appreciate it. And we're going to move on. This is closing comments by Dr. Ash Bachari. Here we go. Uh, thank you so much, <laughs> Beth, Caroline, Caroline. Thank you very much. And a big thank you to everyone. I would like to especially thank our leaders and distinguished speakers present here who made the Pop Ocean Virtual Summit a reality. Thank you for your experience, your knowledge, and wisdom, which have added great value to the Pop Ocean Initiative and, in particular, to advocacy for the ocean giving the several hundred participants and viewers from, from Zoom and Facebook and so on, um, a tremendous, in, tremendous amount of insight and perspective on the importance of protecting our ocean as well as very importantly, tools to take action in their countries, geographies and around the world. Uh, I also wanna say uh, that for those who are new to the POP movement, may I please request you to join. There's a link in the chat box. I'm gonna request Komal if you don't mind just dropping it there. Uh, it'll only take a few seconds to put in your details, but we greatly look forward to staying in touch with all of you to follow up on the activities, programs, summits, and events that the Pop Up Ocean Initiative intends to organize in the weeks and months to come. We will be taking, we will be organizing these and we'd love to, to have all of you engaged. And I just want to convey our deepest thanks, uh, your ex for your wisdom, your inspiration, your leadership. And, um, and finally, I would like to also close by saying, I invite you, let's join hands and protect our planet. The time is now. We've heard that over and over through the course of uh, the last some hours. And I want to say in um, my father's words, universal family, let's seize the moment and become leaders of urgent action under the pop movement. Thank you, all of you, for being here, for contributing, and being part of this mo movement. And as I close, I also want to say a, a very big thank you to the pop family into the Pop Ocean family for everything. So it's been a great pleasure and honor, many thanks. That's the, that's the link there. So if you could, um, yeah, if you could fill that out and let us have your details, we'll look forward to staying in touch. Thank you all very, very much. Over to you, Summer. Yes. Thank you all for joining. This was incredibly inspiring and I'm so happy to have so many different countries represented here and so many different perspectives from youth to politicians to students and all kinds of people. Thank you so much for joining everybody. We'll be in touch for sure uh, with, with all of the activities that are in the pipeline um, and we look forward to having you join. A big welcome to the POP family. Movimiento pop, los jóvenes, you know you just can't stop. Working coast to coast en el mar, do your bit and become a real pop star. Youth inspired by knowledge, whether at home, school or college. Stop and visualize and you will realize real fears. I'm now an ocean filled with tears. I keep you alive with oxygen and air to thrive. But now I'm still where once filled with krill. Overfishing for money and pescado, you left me nothing but lonely, sad and enojado. Today I feel nothing but the throttle of your 
a plastic cap and bottle No life, no weed, no fish And thanks to you, I'm hardly left with a last wish So open your eyes and realize it's real That sea level rise I'm brimming with CO2 Could it be thanks to you Bleaching quarrel Or just the absence of moral A lack of biodiversity Will bring adversity With any number of years in university Not long from now you go like wow When the day will dawn And everything I've got to offer is gone I mean nada Even dia dia a cada But hey It's not too late to alter your state So stop acidification across the world And in every nation Spare la preciosa vida the marina, you know it's divina. Prevent extinction with total conviction. Do your bit for flora and fauna. Before the ocean is nothing but a breathless hot sauna. Don't you see? It's time to get drastic and eliminate that plastic. Reduce pollution and become the solution. Protect the coast, make it for a most. Stop the commotion, tap your emotion. Change your notion and protect the ocean. Movie me and top pop. Los Jovenes, you know you just can't stop. Youth inspired by knowledge, inspired by knowledge, inspired by knowledge, inspired by knowledge. Inspired by knowledge. Inspired by knowledge.